Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. This is another presentation by Liberty and Health Alliance. I'm Dr. Leela Lewis. I'm the president of Liberty and Health Alliance and the host of tonight's program entitled Vaccine Mandates, Force and Freedom on the Front Lines. Although the issue of vaccine mandates has unfortunately become a political issue, Liberty and Health Alliance is by no means a political entity. We take no association with any political party. Our sole purpose is to lift Christ up and lift up the issue of liberty of conscience. We all have the right to choose a God-given choice and freedom. We're Seventh-day Adventist Christians who come and welcome, obviously, all people of all faiths and beliefs. Again, our purpose is to protect an individual's choice. As the threatening of liberty of conscience becomes stronger and stronger, and it seems to be eliminating at a faster rate, Liberty and Health Alliance felt it important to create the document the Liberty of Conscience document. To date, over 18,440 people have signed the documents from 129 different countries with different walks of life and faith. If you have not yet had an opportunity to sign the petition, we ask that you go to the website libertyandhealth.org and that's spelled out Liberty and and health.org and please download the document read it and if you agree we ask you to sign it and share it with those that you love and know as well we also ask that if any of you feel impressed to give donations to help with additional liberty of conscience and health related issues please do so at the website as well Again, tonight we're going to be inviting a lot of additional guests. Many, many people are hurting. Their stories, their stories are heart-wrenching. And as they have signed the Liberty of Conscience document, they have put unsolicited in their own words in the comments section their stories. And we at Liberty and Health Alliance felt you needed to hear their voices. Some, a very small number of these, will be heard tonight. We hope that you will get a blessing from hearing their stories and they too will get a blessing and be blessed. At this time, I'm invite, excited to invite my good friend, Dr. Greg King. And Dr. King, to give us opening prayer, Dr. King is a longtime friend and longtime professor of religion at several Seventh-day Adventist institutions and colleges. He has his PhD in Biblical Studies from Union Theological Seminary, and he's a former professor of mine. Dr. King, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, as we have recently entered into the Sabbath hours or will soon be welcoming the Sabbath hours wherever we may live, we want to experience a special closeness with you. When you walk this earth, we know that you dealt with unseeing eyes and unhearing ears and unfeeling hearts. And Lord, our prayer this evening is a simple one to encompass all of those faculties. Open our eyes that we might have a deeper understanding of your truth and open our eyes to see the needs of those around us, some of whom are facing difficulty in connection with COVID mandates. Open our ears to your word, Lord, so that we might understand it more fully and completely and open our ears to the pleas of those who are dealing with difficulties in this pandemic. And mostly, Lord, open our hearts to a deeper experience with you and may our hearts also be united with those who are facing challenge and loss at this time. We ask for your blessing on this program this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. King. I also want to introduce, we'll keep Dr. King on the screen. I want to introduce two more of our pastoral leadership that will be joining us this evening. We have Pastor James Rafferty. 
Pastor Rafferty is an ordained pastor, evangelist, and author, full-time ministry in over 37 years with a focus particularly on Daniel and Revelation. And we're going to be very interested in his take on that tonight. And we are also excited to welcome Pastor Ron Kelly. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty, for joining us. We're welcome, welcome back. And Pastor Ron Kelly, he's the senior pastor of the Village Seventh-day Adventist Church in Berrien Springs, Michigan. He's married to his wife, Colleen, and she's a school teacher, and together they have four children. So again, thank you for joining us, Pastor Kelly. In addition to our three pastoral uh, recommendations that we've just discussed, we have a lot of other guests that we're looking forward to hearing from, and we'll introduce them as the time allots. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Well, as we mentioned already, God is providing us a wonderful opportunity to stand up for liberty of conscience. And the Liberty and Health Alliance, again, produced the document, the Liberty of Conscience document. Well, tonight we have a question for you, Dr. King. Dr. King, many of these people that we will be interviewing tonight, like we mentioned, wrote in the comments section of the Liberty and Health document when they put their signature there to indicate their stories. For those who haven't yet had a chance to see the Liberty of Conscience document, can you just give us a little overview of what that document is, what, it, what its purpose actually was? Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for the question. It seems to me that there were a couple of major factors that precipitated the document. Those of us who were involved with Liberty and Health Alliance became aware of, of two important things that were taking place. One is these mandates that are taking place and in many cases threatening the employment, the livelihood of people, they were gathering steam, they were continuing to proliferate. And we had a concern on the infringement of the liberty of conscience that these mandates were bringing about. And secondly, and this is a, a heartfelt pastoral concern, and I know Dr. Lewis, you experienced this as well. I don't know how many people I've had come to me expressing concern about how they could be faithful to their conscientious convictions in this regard, and yet continue to maintain their employment. And so as we saw people being threatened with the loss of employment, in some cases, the loss of home after they lost employment, difficulties for their families and all that this would pretend, we felt it was necessary to speak on behalf of these individuals. And so it was out of a heart of pastoral concern that a number of us came together in order to give voice to these individuals who were facing difficulty and to let them know that, that someone in the church cares for them, that we are supportive of them and their difficulty in the current pandemic. Thank you so much, Dr. King. We appreciate that. And Pastor Rafferty, you know, we've been talking about coercion and specifically limitations of freedom. Where did mm -hmm. this actually originate anyway, this idea that you can coerce or limit an individual's freedom? That is a great question, uh, Dr. Leela Lewis, and uh, really appreciated what uh, Pastor Greg had to share. The, the, origi the originator of coercion, force, and control is Satan. He's symbolized in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, as the dragon. But he doesn't work uh, independently of human beings. In fact, in the book of Revelation, as well as in Daniel, he works through earthly powers, which are symbolized as beasts. And there are two beasts that are specifically identified in Revelation chapter 13 that are using uh, coercion, control, manipulation, deception, and specifically limiting people from buying and selling, from making a livelihood. And these two powers are brought to view in the book of Revelation in the very end of time. And I believe that tonight we're going to be looking at a little bit of Daniel, a little bit of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24, and a little bit of Revelation. We're going to delve into just what this control and coercion looks like in the uh, context of our present time. Thank you so much, Pastor Rafferty. And we are looking forward to that presentation. I hope everyone will stay tuned. Pastor Rafferty has been going to be presenting some very interesting things. Some have asked the question, is this the mark of the beast? And 
we want to look at that, but we'll, we'll take a little time to come back to that. And Pastor Kelly, we have a follow-up question for you. You know, some prominent leaders, even within the Christian world, have stated things like, well, in, in, it's God's will that we have limitations of speech or limitations or even, I dare say, even coercion. Is this the way that we see God behaving in the Bible or is there something else? Well, it, you don't have to read very far in the Bible to find out that God believes in the freedom to discuss things. Uh, we have Genesis chapter 3. We know from the rest of the Bible story there was war in heaven. That war spilled over to the Garden of Eden. And while Adam and Eve did have some knowledge that uh, that was going on, they had been warned, God did not keep uh, Lucifer, who had become Satan, from having access to talk to them. And uh, this is clearly misinformation. It's twisted information. And yet God is allowing them to decide what they're going to do. So uh, unfortunately, now that we live in a sinful world, that free expression and autonomy of self is even more important. It's not that we don't have any interest in the larger experience for the group. But in a sinful world, the group is protected by the perspectives and the freedom of these dialogues. So in heaven, Lucifer was allowed to uh, go amongst the angels. And for a while, Many of them followed him. We know in the end a third did. And on planet Earth, we see God allowing this opportunity to talk. And, and then the coercive side, God could have cut this thing really short if uh, the benefit of the group minus free speech and minus uh, liberty of conscience were to be the way he was going to work. But he didn't. He let it go forward. And uh, if we want a free society and we actually want a safe society, we're going to have to follow the methods and the implementation of God's ways. Thank you so much, Pastor Kelly. That truly sets the framework, I think, for today's discussion. Like we mentioned at the outset, we are going to be listening to the voices of those who are going on the front lines and experiencing these, van these mandates firsthand. Many have lost their jobs and much more. And you're going to find something very peculiar and very reassuring in each one of their voices. There's a sense of faith and hope in God. And we hope that you will catch on to this great, beautiful message of mercy that no matter what comes our way, God is always with us. Well, the first guest I want to invite is Dr. Gloria Kim. Is Dr. Kim with us tonight? Dr. Kim is an obstetrician and gynecologist in Illinois. Just before the program started, I got a text from Dr. Kim. She also is an OB, just like myself. It says that she's in. she tried to get in the room, um, but the room is full. So perhaps we can take someone out um, and we'll come back to Dr. Kim in just one minute. She's an OB. She had to run and do a delivery. And I certainly understand what that's like. Well, let's go to Miss Linda Jacobs. Is Miss Linda here? Yes, I'm Linda. Linda. Wonderful. <laughs> Linda is joining us. Hi, Linda. You're joining us Hello. from Australia. Thank you so Hi, much Dr. for joining Lila. us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're very happy to have you. So in Australia, you're a little ahead of us in time right now, but I understand in talking to you a little earlier that you have a 14-year-old and 11-year-old, very similar to my, the ages of a couple of my children as well. And you moved so that you could be near a Seventh-day Adventist education system. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. We went to, well, we had been in the city in another um, Adventist school, but we had heard some amazing stories from this one. So we've moved to the country and we've left Sydney, just um, left our jobs, left everything to come here. And um, so your children, I could dare say for, for you, the children are paramount of importance. And that's a, a most important aspect of yours and your husband's life. Is that correct? Yes, true. very much so. so Tell me a little bit about your biggest concerns. I mean, obviously, we, we're going to hear from some other Australians as well as some of the current um, mandates that are taking place. But what are some of your biggest concerns, particularly related to your children right now? Yes. Um, well, I guess with the school itself, we, we're in a beautiful school with um, Adventist teachers and there is this mandate at the moment for the 11th of no the 8th of November that all teachers must be double vaxxed. That's all staff on school, um, chaplains, teacher aides, principals, everybody. 
Um, and it's really making it challenging for a lot of people because a, a lot of people uh, have, you know, we have a health message. We want to be careful what we do with our bodies and role model to the children the best way of doing things as well. So we're um, in, in a situation where we may be losing many of our teachers and principals and things in our churches and um, that will be a deficit for our children as well. But, um, you know, our other concern is that some have, you know, had to have the vaccine because of financial reasons and that sort of thing. But when we all do that, um, at the moment there is a, um, the vaccine is available for 12 to 16-year-olds here in Australia, although not yet mandated. But um, how much longer before they do mandate it, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if they will, but it, it looks like it could possibly go that way. And um, to think that our children have to deal with that. My 11-year-old said to me, do you, Mum, lucky I'm only 11. I don't have to get vaccinated yet. Um, but he'll be 12 soon enough. And, um, yes, it's... It's just a matter of time. If you're 16 and over, they do require you to be vaccinated, so to go to places and that. And in, in Sydney, it's just been horrendous. Um, we have friends that have, they've been in lockdown since July and their children haven't attended school since then. So they're, um, they've been able to form this special little bubble of three children recently, but only if all their parents have been double vaccinated. So it, it's just been a, a crazy place to be here in Australia and particularly in Sydney, which I'm thankful I'm not there at the moment. Thank you so much, Linda. We, we have a follow-up question, just a very brief, brief question, but it's important. It's probably the most important. How do you hope to see God work in, in all of this situation? How, how do you hope to see it coming about? Well, um, something that I would love to see is that um, God perform some amazingly mighty miracle and that through that our Adventist church, our world church, may be able to just stand for freedom of choice for people and people would be able to see that we as a church not only serve a mighty God, who gives us freedom and hope and a future, but a God who cares for us and the little things and um, that our church has a health message. And imagine that this could draw people to God, to our church, and God's name would truly be glorified and our schools would then be able to do what they do best and they have a wonderful mission and it's just amazing that the teachers and staff that are at our schools, how they encourage children. And, yes, it's amazing. It really is. that We really need to protect our schools. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you to our teachers and our church administrators around the world for supporting our Adventist education. I am a, I'm a product of Adventist education, and I believe it for all of my children. So th thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for that beautiful vision and, and the situation there in Australia. Thank you. Well, we want to come back to Dr. Gloria Kim. As I mentioned, Dr. Kim is an obstetrician and gynecologist. She practices in Illinois. Hi, Dr. Kim. It's a blessing to have you with us here this evening. She just had a delivery. Now, Dr. Kim, your situation at work right there in Illinois you know, you and I talked on the phone. We've texted back and forth over the last few months. Tell us a little bit about what was going on. And we want to hear how God blessed tremendously in your situation. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and truly a privilege. Um, you know, I tried to, I thought I could fly under the radar when the vaccines came out. and um, But then I realized increasingly that I could not. And when my hospital um, gave a mandate, I realized that, um, you know, that I had to make my stand, I had to make my decision. And, um, and so I applied for a faith based exemption. And by the grace of God, it was accepted. So I, I, I feel so thankful about it. But there's a number of things that I really learned. And I felt like there were four things that I really wanted to share tonight. 
you know, um, number one, I learned that I had to rely on God alone. You know, there are many times where I looked at certain spiritual leaders to guide me. I felt like they were biblically solid and they would show me what to do. And when I searched, you know, I realized that many times, you know, there were there was no one speaking about conscience, especially at the beginning. And so I felt very alone. And so I had to learn to completely depend on God. And so I came to a point where I completely surrendered my future, my job, my security, um, even the ability to practice, you know, in my state or even potentially in the states as well. And I, um, and I also surrendered my children's future to God. And I came to a point where I realized that I was no longer controlled by fear. Like, um, and then I experienced a freedom that I have never experienced before because I could not be controlled by fear of the organization, fear of um, the consequences, because I knew that if I followed my conscience, if I followed God's will, I would, I would be secure. And so, you know, I think that a lot of us feel alone. You know, sometimes we feel abandoned by our churches, our local pastors, even a conference or denomination. But I, what I realized is there are thousands of fellow Adventists and Christians of other denominations who have actually chosen to stand with us. And we are earnestly praying for one another. So you are not alone. So there are four things I learned. Number two, we cannot let bitterness take root in our hearts. You know, we have to do the right thing for the right reason and keep doing it. So if we let bitterness um, towards people or, um, you know, organizations come into our heart, it's going to be poison and it's going to prevent us from God's blessings. Um, number three, um, I learned that we have to pray and we have to claim the promises of God. You know, I um, I learned to, you know, put sticky notes, you know, all over my computer as um, I was waiting for the results of my exemption. And um, I put all these Bible verses and I prayed and Jeremiah 32, 17, where it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. And so, you know, there's nothing too hard for God. He can and will take care of us and our families. And I just remembered Oswald Chambers. He has a wonderful devotional, my favorite reading, which says, um, gracious uncertainty. And he says that Christians, we have gracious uncertainty. We are uncertain in all our ways, but we are certain of God. We are just uncertain of what he's going to do next. And ever since for the past five to six years, I've started a prayer journal and I pray until the answers come. And I have seen miracles. I've seen miracles in my patients I prayed for, medical miracles. I've seen spiritual miracles. I've seen financial miracles. So there is nothing too hard for God. When we completely surrender and we step out in faith, I know God can and will answer. And then lastly, the fourth thing that I learned is um, that those of us whose jobs were spared, my job was spared, but many of you, your jobs were not spared. And, you know, I feel that my job was spared for a purpose. And, you know, I have a duty to help my brothers and sisters with with whoever jobs are spared, we have a duty to help our brothers and sisters with our means, our resources and whatever we have. Um, and so just closing, I wanted to say one Bible verse that really sustained me. It was in Deuteronomy 31.6. Um, and I, it was on my computer for months. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Dr. Kim, that was so inspirational. And I just praise God so much for what he's done. And I just can't wait to continue to work with you. So again, thank you, Dr. Kim, and God bless you and your family. Our next guest is Pastor Allen. Pastor Allen Todd, he is a pastor of Global Apostolic Ministries. He's been pastoring for more than 25 years. He's a denominational leader from Canada, married to his wife, Allison, for 27 years and has eight wonderful children. Pastor Allen, it is a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. Thank you so much for joining us from Canada. Hey, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. You know, um, you're, you, you came in contact with the Liberty of Conscience document. Can you share just a little bit about how 
that came about. Yeah, it, it was quite interesting. And, and, you know, in this whole development of, you know, fighting for freedom and trying to, you know, take a stand, uh, I, I was running a couple of uh, truth symposiums here in Canada. Well, you know, it was going all over the world. And one of the attendees, a friend of mine that I knew, uh, sent me over uh, a link to the website. And uh, it was actually a, a seminar, an online seminar you were doing. And, and I linked in, it was when you were doing the read, you know, the full read through of uh, the document. And, uh, and I said, wow, this was absolutely awesome. And it's so important for us that, you know, uh, across denominational lines within the faith that we need to be reaching out and standing together. So um, it was it sent to me, I read it through and, and then I, 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 caught, I got in touch with you guys and said, listen, can, can I use this? Can we get this information to other pastors and church leaders? And uh, the, your organization was so gracious uh, we had a couple of conversations and said, absolutely, uh, let's get other individuals uh, involved. So that's how I got in touch with uh, with uh, Liberty and Health. Well, Pastor Allen, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and get to know you, and I look forward to continuing to get to know you. Can you share with us a little bit about how things have been in Canada for, for some of your church members there in the Pentecostal movement? Yeah, you know, it, it's been like uh, our previous speaker, Dr. Kim, was talking about, um, you know, in, in Ontario here and also part across Canada, you know, livelihoods and jobs and individuals are, are the mandating um, is quite rigid and strict. And people are being, you know, told that if they don't get double vaccinated by October 30th, October 15th, November the 1st, um, that they'll be put on unpaid leave. Um, you know, it's that kind of thing. And it's every, it's every sector. So people in the body of Christ are impacted, uh, by that. But, uh, what's really encouraging that there's a lot of people that are, you know, taking a stand and saying they, they're, you know, they want to stand for what they believe and, and, and have autonomy of their body and freedom of choice. So it, it's, it's, it's a pretty challenging time. You know, we've, uh, sorry, and I'll add, We've had several people who have submitted religious exemption letters and they've been declined. Um, and so they've got to go back again at a, with another strategy to, to, to get their case heard. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Pastor Allen. How would you encourage, you know, you talked about us working together as fellow believers from lots of different faiths and denomination. How would you encourage your fellow ministers, whether of your own denomination or of other denominations, to act at this time of global crisis? You know, the, the, the one thing that I would really want to encourage all pastors to do is to work really hard to keep their congregations in unity. And, 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 and what I mean by that is that it, it's very easy to have vaccinated and unvaccinated people in a congregation and, you know, there's at each other. Uh, and I and I think it's really important. In some cases, we have pastors who have been vaccinated and are unwilling to support or write letters for individuals in the congregation who are asking for an exemption letter from their pastor. I think it's really important that pastors, you know, apply Romans 14 to how they lead and, and support people based on whatever decision they've made to faithfully stand before Christ. Uh, and so I want to encourage pastors to really think that through. Think about the importance of keeping the church in unity, your assembly in unity. And, and we are we're we're standing for a, a very high principle of freedom. And uh, it's not necessarily if you want to be vaccinated or not. It's the principle of of, of freedom. And so I would really I, that's what I would really want to encourage pastors and leaders to to focus on unity of the, the body. Thank you so much, Pastor Allen. So well said. And thank you again for joining us this evening. It's been a blessing. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We want to come back to Dr. King. You know, Dr. King, liberty of conscience threatened doesn't just begin right off the bat overtly with loss of life. 
there's a subtle change. There's a, a little bit here, a little bit there. Are there any biblical examples where we see freedom of those who follow God being curtailed or limited? And what are some of the positive lessons that we can learn from some of those biblical examples today? Dr. Lewis, I'd like to take us way back in scripture. My friend, Pastor Rafferty earlier mentioned some examples from Daniel and, and Matthew, but I want to take us back even earlier than that in scripture. I think sometimes when we think of persecution of the followers of God, we think of New Testament persecutions like took place in the time of Nero or the Emperor Domitian when John the Revelator was exiled to the island of Patmos. Or perhaps we think of when Daniel and his three friends faced the test in Daniel chapter 1. But I'd like to go back to a time earlier than that in Exodus chapter 1, when those who were the people of God were facing some severe persecution. You see, the Bible tells us, and it's a verse that's familiar to many people, Exodus chapter 1 verse 8, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now, it's interesting to note that that king is not even named, while later on in the chapter, some individuals who decide to act nobly and courageously for God are named in this case. But what this pharaoh, this king of Egypt, proceeds to do is he proceeds to, to classify the children of Israel, the people of God, as a threat, to, to marginalize them in the society in which they were living, because he wanted, his, he wanted to communicate to his people that the Israelites were threatening them, that, that the Israelites might join in with the enemies of Egypt. So what did they do? Well, they took them and enslaved them. But as the Bible tells us, God continued to bless Israel. They continued to multiply. And so the Pharaoh of Egypt then took another step. He commanded that the Hebrew midwives should kill any baby boys that were born among the Israelites. And the chapter proceeds to tell us that the Israelite midwives chose not to do that. They refused to do that. They, they had a respect for human life. And so because of their courageous decision, and this would be considered one of the first examples of civil disobedience in the Bible, God blessed them in remarkable ways. And, and God, their names are even mentioned in, in Scripture because of God's blessing was upon them. And then Pharaoh involved the entire people in this attempted genocide because he commanded that any baby boy who should be born to the Israelites should be cast into the Nile in order to basically end what he perceived as the threat from the children of Israel. And so what you see, Dr. Lewis, is there was a calculated strategy to classify the people of Israel as threatening to others, as threatening to their neighbors. But, but, you know, even though this is a difficult story to read in some ways, to think about the long years of enslavement that Israel endured, the, the difficulties that they faced, I believe when we read scripture, we should detect the message of hope that, that pulsates in the pages of scripture, because what the Bible tells us is very important, and I think this is an important message for our audience this evening. I come to Exodus chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. It says, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So whatever difficulties one may be facing, difficulties of liberty of conscience, difficulties with COVID vaccine, vaccination mandates at work, I think we can take comfort in the fact that God knows when we are when walking a difficult path, when we are trying to be faithful to the Lord. And then secondly, and this is a very important point to make, when we read this section of Exodus, we know that, that Moses is born and Moses is the great deliverer of his people. And so what the Bible tells us is that with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God worked to bring deliverance to his people. And so, Dr. Lewis, as we see these events happening in the world around us, belonging to a church which has long believed that liberty of conscience would be restricted, would be curtailed in significant ways in the last days, I believe that we should see in this the foreshadowing of the great and final deliverance that God will bring to us when he comes to take his people to be with him forever. So just as, in a sense, the sufferings of the Israelites 
were the birth pangs of the deliverance from Egypt and the mighty exodus that took place. Even so, we can see some of the challenges and restrictions on liberty of conscience that we face as being nothing but the birth pangs of the great deliverance that God is going to bring his people. And so in that light, we can rejoice in the hope of that wonderful deliverance. Dr. King, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with that, that with us, both biblically as examples, but also as reminding us that very soon, yes, that deliverance is coming and we can look up and know it's coming soon. Thank you again, Dr. King. Well, again, people are suffering. People are suffering in the shadows tonight and we want to bring them to the light. They have written in, they've pled, they've asked for help. We want to do more than just bring their stories to you tonight. We're bringing you their stories so that you too can join in the effort to help them. Again, if you haven't signed the document, we ask that you do that. But also, please, if God is impressing upon your mind to donate towards those who are hurting this evening, please, please do so at the website. Again, we want to hear from a few more individuals. I want to invite my friend, my new friend, Sarah Maxwell. Sarah was a marketing director in Vancouver, British Columbia. This is our first time of getting to see each other. Welcome, Sarah. It's a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Sarah, we're having a little hard time hearing you. Maybe you could turn your oh. volume up just a, there we go, perfect. Uh, Sarah, you were there, you worked in upper management with your company for over four years. And for the last 18 months during COVID, you essentially worked essentially from home. But then over a week ago, you were recently suspended. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? And with your suspension, you're not getting paid, I understand correctly. Uh, yeah, I basically, yeah. So I'm not uh, just uh, in small correction. I, I was a training manager, not marketing, but that's that's kind of a moot point. Um, but um, yeah, I was basically trusted to write um, training documents for, for people who to keep them safe during COVID. Um, so I was the one who was doing the whole wash your hands, here you how you do it steps. Um, so I was trusted to do everything like that um, for the entire time of COVID, um, you know, referred to as a hero um, and all those kind of things. And then um, because of pressure that was put on uh, my company by other clients and then pressure that was put on them by the Ministry of Health and so on and so forth, um, it just kind of rippled down and to the point where they basically sent out a very legalistic letter saying you have to be uh, double vaccinated by October 12th um, or, you know, your job could be at risk. And um, when I asked questions, um, my questions went unanswered. Um, and until I had put a request uh, for religious exemption um, and that, that one was basically ignored as well. Um, and until I had, I had sent another request of saying, hey, can we please have a conversation? Um, I'd like to have you know, a better understanding of what's going on and what's happening. Um, and until I had stated, hey, I, here's a letter attached that I've counseled with a, a, a lawyer about, um, that's when they were willing to talk to me. So um, I know they were doing, you know, I have to believe that they were doing what they felt was, was right. Um, but at the same time to get a notice to say, do this or else you're going to be without a paycheck. Um, that's when I felt that I was backed into a corner. Um, and I wasn't being really truly given a choice, nor was I being heard out or listened to. Um, and so that was kind of my, my overall experience. Um, as far as you know, just me personally, um, there there were individuals who tried their best, um, but overall, um, you know, the decision was the decision, um, and it was all very kind of last minute and and again legalistic le letters, which came across as quite um, impersonal, um, despite the work and the effort that I had put forward with my with what I was doing for work. Thank you, Sarah, Thank for you. sharing that. Now, now, you're a highly yeah. qualified, amazing woman, uh, very employable. Why Why would you put everything on the line to avoid a vaccine? And what has God taught you from this experience? Uh, yeah, so for me, it's not, it's, it's less about the vaccine. It's less about 
do you know um i'm i'm perfectly fine with people who have chosen that that's what they feel is is best for themselves um the same way as i would want someone to respect me for my choice um so it really came down to the freedom to choose um the freedom to to actually have the peace um and i that was that that was really what it was and it what it came down to for me uh when i prayed about it when i fasted when i went to my my church family and i said you know here's the situation here's what's going on um you know the anxiety that came with it the stress the sleepless nights and all of that um what it really came down to for me was just to have that that freedom of choice and the peace that doesn't come from being coerced into trying to do something um and uh and so again like i i i prayed i studied um you know i i looked into i knew i know i'm not the first and only person to say you know to have a situation where it's do this or else uh, <laughs> i'm not the first and i won't be the last so i looked to you know to read in god's word well what what is it who what have other people done um, you know, so I did, I, I went and I read Daniel and I, I read his examples of, you know, his, his things that he chose to, to stand for, um, you know, Esther, where she, you know, she went through and said, you know what, I'm going to risk this in order to save others. Um, and, and it was those discomforts, um, that they, that they did do. Um, and so for me, when it came to, um, you know, the risk of, my 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 salary <laughs> the risk of losing my paycheck and um and and potentially you know my job um ultimately then i said well god's god's greater than that um i am more than my employment status um and god will take care of that um and the only time that i had peace in what i was doing or not doing or choosing to do or choosing not to do was when I decided that no matter what, I was just going to do all for the glory of God, um, that I was going to, you know, I finally uh, had uh, an appointment with uh, and a, and a, a meeting with one of my managers and the HR manager, where my entire purpose was to just share some of my stories, share my faith walk, um, glorify God, um, speak to truth to them, you know, pray for their hearts, um, because I don't know what God's doing in and through their lives, but asking that God use me um, in order to help to to put him on the pedestal and not myself. Um, and so ultimately, that's that's really what it came down to um, is just making sure that I'm being that example of bringing people together and, and showing God's love as opposed to um, dividing people and saying, well, you're over here and you're over here and you were good enough a few months ago, but as of last Tuesday, you're no longer good enough. I don't want that to be my message and I don't believe that's God's message either. God says, everyone can come, you're all sinners. We are all sinners. <laughs> um, that's why we need Christ. And and so ultimately um, that's, what, that's what it has to be about. It, it, it can't be about, um, you know, what a person chooses to do here or chooses not to do there. It's it's do they know who Christ is and um, have they accepted him and asking myself, how am I doing at sharing that with other people? Because that's ultimately what it comes down to. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's beautiful. And again, you know, right now we're, we're going to keep praying for you and the job situation. I know God will take care of you. But your testimony alone is so encouraging to so many. So thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. And we will stay in contact. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Um, on that note, um, God did answer a prayer. And I was offered a position with a different company um, yesterday. So after I got That's off the phone. Wonderful. With you, actually. wonderful. <laughs> so he's. Lord. Yes. God will make a way. Answer. God will make a way. We, we may not see it clearly now, but he will make a way for us. So thank you for sharing that with us, Sarah. And thank you for joining. Well, I'm excited to invite our next guest. This uh, individual, she and I have became again, very quick friends. Her name is Micheline Barrett. She's a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and elementary teacher. She's been working in the New York education system for over eight years. Micheline, um, you have a wonderful testimony. 
you too experienced some great heartache, great stress over the last few months, and and you too are in a situation now where, where you are unemployed. Can you just very briefly tell us how did an amazing teacher who was very sought after end up unemployed? I just want to start off by saying thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lewis and Liberty Health Alliance for giving me this opportunity to share my story. Um, so I lost my job in due to the COVID-19 mandate. And this happened in October. October 4th was actually the day that I was no longer allowed into the school building. Um, I submitted a religious exemption and my, my religious exemption was denied. And I also put in for to request an appeal and my appeal was also denied. And there were a few teachers who received an appeal hearing and at the appeal hearing, um, we were based, they were basically asking like, why was our you know, religious exemption denied? And the lawyers representing um, the New York City you know, Department of Education were saying basically that you know, the Pope said that it's fine to take the vaccine, so why shouldn't you know, all Christians take it? So that was very shocking because a lot of us are, you know, Seventy Adventists, Baptists, and you know, it was very shocking because we don't answer to the Pope. Well, that's that's very sad. You you said something to me when we were when we were talking yesterday, and you described how, as you were leaving the building, and even before that, you know, you. We, we talked about why, why did you do this? Why were you willing to give up? You love teaching. You've been teaching for eight years. You, you have a wonderful rapport with the children. And your, your fellow teachers were like, what are you doing, Micheline? What, what was it that inspired you to stick to what you believe that God was telling you to do? That's so true. You know, everyone would think like, why would I do this? You know, I love working with children. But what I realized is that I was standing up for what I believed in and I wasn't going to go against my conscience. I wasn't going to go against the Holy Spirit's voice just to keep my job. And the reason why I could strongly say this is during the pandemic, I was going around si singing, um, you know, sharing my videos of me singing with different churches and a, and a lot of the times I was singing this song titled God Provides and when I was at work the last day of work that song came to my mind and the words in the song that says God provides so why do I worry about my life and those words are the words that gave me strength I was as I was walking out the building and those words in the song helped me strengthen me in my decision to walk away way. Wow. Micheline, you sent me that song and I, I listened to it and I listened to it again. And wow. I hope we, we're actually going to listen to a part of it. It's a beautiful long song. We'll put it at the link on our website. Um, but I'm not sure if it's able to be played or not. And can we can we s play the song of Micheline singing the song? And he, actually, as I envisioned you leaving the building, as you were telling me the story, I could just imagine as I listened to your voice, you singing through the corridors and all your teachers and your fellow students watching you as you're walking out for that last time. Again, standing for what you believe. And just like was previously said by Sarah, it's not so much about the vaccine as much as it is the ability to stand for what you believe that God is calling you to do. It's so beautiful. So I'm not sure if our IT uh, department is able to make our our song play. Are we able to get that up? Looks like we're still having trouble. Micheline, don't. God provides, so why do I worry about my life? When you've come to my rescue a thousand times, every other voice it is alive. God provides, God provides In ways I can't explain, I can't deny The little that I have, He more 
multiplies just when I feel he won't show up on time. God provides, he'll come through. When the clouds of doubt rain down on you and test everything you thought you knew, now you finally see what God can do for you. So tonight, close your eyes, there's no more need to fight. Watch God provide. Miss Shalene, that's beautiful. And we are, I am personally praying for you. I know God will Thank provide. You. He will provide for you. He will provide for me. He will provide for all of our viewers watching. And if those of you who are watching right now are feeling the pain and the scared and the fear that how am I going to pay my bills? Where am I going to go? Remember Micheline's song, God Will Provide. And if there's Amen. others of you that have means that can help provide, God provides us means so that we can help our brothers and sisters. So if there are any of those of you who are watching, please, God will bless as you provide. Thank you again, Micheline, and thank you for your song. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm going to ask Pastor Rafferty. Pastor Rafferty, Micheline, and Sarah, they both mentioned something that I, I found to be so beautiful. And they mentioned this idea that they're willing to sacrifice it all, that, that they know, for their belief that what they think God wants them to do. And Sarah mentioned Daniel and that this was the inspiration for her as she as she looked at Daniel and she looked at Esther and she looked at these biblical examples. This was how she found hope and faith to follow what she believed God wanted her to do. And the same thing with Michelin and the same thing with the others that we've heard. We also have been told that there's a direct connection between Daniel and the book of Revelation. And some are asking, what's the connection with this current situation and the mark of the bees mm -hmm. and that Jesus soon returns. So we're looking for you, Pastor Rafferty, to help us to understand prophetically how mm -hmm. we're sitting in this current situation. Pastor Rafferty. Thank you, Dr. Leela. Th these people are amazing people. I'm just so inspired by the testimonies um, that each one has been given and the stand they've been taking. And I just wish uh, all Christians and especially our church would listen to these voices and recognize something that is very prophetic and very profound. And we're going to look at these, these some things, these principles in Daniel, Revelation, and Matthew chapter 24. I hear a lot of our church leaders and a lot of members even uh, and Christians saying, you know, this is not the mark of the beast. This is not the mark of the beast. And we need to save all of our ammunition, so to speak, and for the mark of the beast. But what we find in Daniel is before there was a test on worship, there was a health test, and that's Daniel chapter 1. That's where we are now in principle, because a lot of these prophets wrote for our time upon whom the end of the world are come. That's what we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And so we need to recognize that all these prophecies of the past that have had fulfillment have principles, ideals that help us to navigate the present and the future. Daniel tells us that before there was a worship test, there was a health test. That's where we are now. And if we're not going to stand during this health test, how are we going to stand during the worship test? Now, the book of Daniel is understood to be a twin of the book of Revelation. In fact, they connect together in so many ways. They talk about the same powers, earthly powers, the, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrible beast, all outlined in Daniel uh, chapters, uh, chapter 7 specifically, and, and again in different symbols in chapters 2 and 8 and 11. And then connecting to Revelation chapter 13, which is really significant, really powerful, because Revelation chapter 13 describes two earthly powers. They're described as beasts because that's a symbol of an earthly power. Two earthly powers that work together in the end of time. And I want to read to you just a couple of verses. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, 
He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. All right? We're going to stop right there. Because what we're recognizing in this verse is a transition. We have a power here that comes out of the earth. Now, we understand as Seventh-day Adventists that this power, this earthly power, is a symbol of the United States of America. We can go into a lot of details about that, but we don't have time right now. But this power is is represented as having two horns like a lamb, lamb like principles of liberty and freedom, conscientious freedom. The principle of civil liberty and the principle of religious liberty is what is symbolized here in these two horns like a lamb. These are the principles that have made this country great, a beacon of light to the whole world, a beacon of freedom to the whole world. But then it says in the same verse, this lamb like earthly kingdom and power is going to speak like a dragon. That's a transition that's going to take place. Now, we haven't gotten to verse 12 yet. We haven't gotten to verse 13 yet. We haven't gotten to verse 14 yet. We haven't gotten to the mark of the beast yet. We haven't gotten to the enforcing so that no man can buy or sell yet. We're still in verse 11. That's where we are right now in prophetic history. We're in verse 11. And verse 11 says there's a transition that's taking place, that this earthly power that was lamb-like, freedom of religion, freedom, civil religion, uh, freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom to, to assemble, etc. Those are going to change into a dragon-like powers, dragon-like principles. And that's the transition we see taking place in America right now. And for our church to be silent on this, for our, for fe our fellow Christians to be silent on this is absolutely unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. We need to recognize that prophecy right now is fulfilling. Now, we're not at the mark of the beast yet. We've said that several times, but here are brave people who are already feeling the dragon-like voice, and they are already sensing, they're already experiencing the consequences of that dragon-like voice, even though we haven't got to the issue of worship yet. Jesus tells us the same thing in Matthew chapter 24. We want to look in Matthew chapter 24, and there's there's three basic stages of development that take place. Matthew chapter 24 is one of those end time chapters that parallels the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. The three stages of deception are earmarked by Christ's warning not to be deceived. The first one is in Matthew 24, verse 4. Many will arise. Many false prophets will arise. Many false Christ or many will arise saying, I am Christ and deceive many. Don't be deceived. Matthew 24, verses 4 through 11 is the first stage of development, actually verses 4 through 10. In that stage, it reads like a newspaper. Let me just read you a few of the verses here. Uh, so powerful. And Jesus answered, verse 4, and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's what we're hearing right now. We've been hearing that. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And then it says in verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many shall be offended and betray one another and shall hate one another. Doesn't that read like the news today, what's happening in our world today? And that word pestilence, which is actually missing from a lot of modern translations, but it's there in the King James and the New King James, that word pestilence means a disease. A pestilence that is going to cause people to be afflicted, and that word afflicted means to be pressured. So what we, hear, we see here taking place is the first stage of deception. We're not at worship yet. We're not at the Sabbath issue yet. We're not at the abomination of desolation yet. That's in the second stage in verses 11 all the way down through verse 23. But in this first stage, we are there because we're seeing natural disasters. We're seeing fire. Well, it looks looks like Pastor Rafferty may have um, may have froze here, but we will. Let's 
see. Sorry for that drop in our internet, but I'm not sure where I got dropped, but I just want to say, just to summarize this, Matthew chapter 24 gives us three stages of deception, and we're in the first one. Natural disasters, rumors of wars, pestilence, infectious disease, famines, pressuring, coming from all nations, pressuring in South America, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, in North America, in Central America, all over this world, people are being pressured because of pestilence. That's where we are right now. We need to recognize that if we can't stand now, how are we going to stand in the second stage and the third stage of deception? The second stage being in the issue of worship. The third stage actually being the personation of, of Christ by saying he's going to show up on this earth in different places, claiming to be Christ, claiming to have made changes in God's law of worship and deceiving multitudes of people. So when we look at all of these principles, Daniel chapter 1 comes before Daniel chapter 3. The health test comes before the worship test. Matthew chapter 24, the first stage of deception before the second stage of deception. Revelation chapter 13, the transition from the lamb-like principles to the dragon-like principles before the worship issue comes into place and the mark of the beast is enforced. We're seeing all of it right now. We're seeing this transition taking place. All of this right now is prophecy being fulfilled. And we need to wake up. Our church needs to wake up. People need to wake up. We need to realize that these last movements are going to be rapid ones. And it's no, we, this is not about trying to save our ammunition for the future. We need to stand up right now for liberty of conscience, for freedom of conscience. Again, it's not about being vaccinated or not being vaccinated. It's about coercion. It's about force. It's about mandate. It's about standing up against these principles that are dragon-like and standing up for the principles that are lamb-like. Thank you so much, Pastor Rafferty. That was so, so phenomenal. And, you know, I think it's really important, just like you pointed out, that so many people have asked, is this the mark of the beast? Because there are so many similarities. You know, we can't buy, we can't sell. We're going to hear a couple more testimonies in just a couple minutes. Loss of money. And even, I dare say, kind of a constitutional death degree in some places where you can't get health care if you're unvaccinated. So it is a little bit deceptive and we are super excited when you come back and the rest of our pastoral staff come back and share with us biblically, what is the mark of the beast anyway from the Bible? We wanna know the truth and we're looking forward to that presentation, but thank you for setting the frame of where we are. So thank you, Pastor Rafferty for that. Amen. Well, I'm very excited to invite our next guest and I will start by saying she does have an alias, and you'll understand very quickly why she has an alias. We're going to be calling her Dr. Lisa Carley. Dr. Carley, as we're calling her, is the medical doctor from Australia. She's a primary care provider. Dr. Carley, we'd like to bring you up. Is Dr. Carley with us? Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Carley, for joining us. And we know we can't see your face, but we're going to have the blessing of hearing your voice. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you for inviting me to share. Well, I, we're looking forward to your story. And I have to say, after you and I spoke this morning, it has, um, it has really affected me. And I know that many on the call today and who are watching and listening will also be touched. So Dr. Carly, can you just briefly tell us, you work at a government hospital in Australia. Can you tell us a little bit about your situation and how you were recently essentially had forced vaccination upon yourself and the trauma and the mental anguish that has come as a result of how you've had to deal with your patients. Sure. Um, I have been practicing in general practice for over 15 years now, um, working in this government facility for over 10 years. I have over 3,000 patients who I am their carer for their medical needs. Um, they have no other doctor to look after those medical needs. Uh, vaccine mandates have been introduced across all of Australia now. In the state of New South Wales, where I live, all healthcare workers in both public and private practice 
have been had to be vaccinated or they can no longer practice. In fact, anybody who has any contact with any other member of the public in their work is required to be vaccinated now. We have a no jab, no job policy. It's a mandate across all sectors of our community. I had to make an extremely difficult decision several weeks ago. I did have a choice of declining the vaccination and walking away from medicine indefinitely or getting the jabs and continuing to care for my patients, most of whom have no other access to medical care. I chose the latter for, my, for the sake of my patients. And the last several weeks have been the most distressing time in my career. The freedom to work and to provide for your family, to pay for your mortgage, requires a double vaccination. The freedom for young people to attend higher education, start an apprenticeship, or even socialize with others is dependent on getting these vaccines. The freedom for grandparents and parents to visit their children and grandchildren, the freedom for those with loved ones who are in aged care facilities or to visit those who are dying is dependent on their vaccination status. To travel out of your local area, to cross state borders, to get on a plane, to visit friends and family, attend weddings and funerals and in any places to even attend church, you have to be fully vaccinated. I have held the hands, I have hugged, I have prayed with, I have prayed for many of my patients as they have cried and shared their distressing stories of why they need to get the vaccine. Less than half of my patients have chosen to get this vaccine for the sake of their health. The vast majority do so just so that they can function in everyday life. Vaccinated or not, we are all prisoners of a public health order and government mandates in Australia. There are no exemptions, no medical exemptions, no mental health exemptions, no religious exemptions. None are allowed. In medical practice personally, there is really no more freedom to practice medicine in this country freely. We are banned from using any other options such as ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine on the threat of taking away our practicing rights and in some places jail time as well. We cannot even openly recommend nutraceuticals or natural methods, things like vitamin D or zinc or any other early management of COVID has been banned. We are indemnified for adverse reactions against vaccines, but our indemnity will be removed if we advise anyone or encourage anyone not to take the vaccine. The doctor-patient relationship has been completely fractured and the healthcare is now completely in the hands of the government. Sorry, can you still hear me? Yes, yes we can. Can you can you hear me, Dr. Carley? I can, thank you. Yes, please. I I I think my internet caused a little trouble right at the same time yours did and your heart-wrenching um, story. So, Dr. Carly, you, you were describing to me this morning when we talked on the phone that even things such as, and I, I just wanna bring this out because to me, you know, it's, it's in some ways, it's not a death decree, but in some ways it's a constitutional death decree. I talked to a, a woman yesterday on the phone and she is ne desperately in need of a sigmoidectomy. She up till now has decided, and she also is from your area in Australia, she had decided that she did not want the vaccine, um, but she needs this life-saving procedure. And, um, and she was describing to me that without getting the vaccine, she cannot have the sigmoidectomy. And you and I talked about that. Is that really the situation that in some cases or in numerous cases, that the, the unvaccinated are actually even being withheld medical care? Across many sectors now, there is definitely a, a loss of right to medical care for the unvaccinated, um, especially in the allied healthcare system. So the psychologists, physical therapists, speech therapists, physiotherapists, all these uh, professions um, will only see the vaccinated people. There is a lot of... Uh, elective surgery where they are now requiring patients to be vaccinated 
I, I personally have not had any patients refuse critical surgery or critical health care, but I am hearing stories of this across the board. And I know that there are also different regions and different states that have uh, different policies that are even stricter than ours. So I can't probably make a comment on all of those, but definitely there is a, a big move towards denying health care to the unvaccinated. For all those of you listening, first of all, I want to say I promised Mrs. Durbin, she asked me to give her name, that we would be praying for her. And she's the lady that gave us permission to tell her story, that God would God would tell her what she what she should do. Only God can tell a person whether they should or should not have a procedure done. And I told Mrs. Durbin, I said, Mrs. Durbin, I cannot give you a recommendation for what you should do. Only God can tell you. But Dr. Carley, I just, I cannot, we want to make sure and pray for Mrs. Durbin and make sure and pray for all of the people that are in this situation. But Dr. Carley, we're praying for you too. What Thank you. Different- situation. You you described to me how, and you even stated so just a few minutes ago, how the patients don't want it and they're coming in crying and you have to give it to them. You even indicated to me how even to recommend a patient take vitamin D and vitamin C, basic nootrotics could actually get you in trouble. Is that not correct? I cannot openly recommend any of this. I often will write it on a piece of paper without saying it. Um, and hand it to my patients so that they may may have an option that I'm not supposed to give. For our viewing audience, again, if you have not yet signed the document, libertyandhealth.org forward slash liberty, please, please sign the document in support of liberty of conscience. Every individual deserves the right of choice. And please donate according to your means and ability. Dr. Carley, where do you see God working in all of this or taking you at this point in such a difficult situation? Uh, For me personally, in this current state that our healthcare system is in, I actually cannot continue to see myself operating as part of this medical regime. Um, With God's help, I am currently making arrangements to go on indefinite leave in a way that won't jeopardise my patient's care. I still truly believe that health is the right hand of the gospel and perhaps God is calling many health professionals to leave these false healthcare systems, at least the ones that are based on force and coercion. My vision of the future is actually pretty dim. I'm finding it quite hard to see beyond the darkness of where the healthcare system is at the moment, but I do have complete faith in our great physician. I know he will perform mighty works with his faithful workers. I truly believe the medical work and the right hand of the gospel will prevail and we will be able to go forward somehow. And I I really would just encourage and urge everybody who's listening, wherever you're listening from, it doesn't matter what mandates or what government restrictions there are. They cannot restrict you from reading the Bible. They cannot restrict you from praying. They cannot restrict you from fasting as we stand for this liberty of conscience issue and God is right beside us. Thank you, Dr. Carly. So very, very well stated and you and your patients are in our prayers. God bless you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, we're joined with Miss Julie McPherson. Julie is a long-standing friend of mine. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Julie. You're joining us from Canada. Um, you just heard Dr. Carley's testimony. I know you described something a little bit similar to what was happening there in Canada. We talked a little while back. You're, you were, of course, a teacher and recently had to lose your job and your husband lost his job. Tell us a little bit about your experience there in Canada. And then we want to talk a little bit about where, where things were about a week ago and how God led you so miraculously just recently. Julie. Thank you, Dr. Leela, for having me. Um, Well, in Canada, we're not quite to the point where Australia is. Um, We're not prisoners in our home yet. We're, um, you know, that really sort of shook me. That was, that's, and I, and I got a note from one of my friends in Australia this morning saying, you know, pray for us. We need help. And so we will pray. We will pray. Um, 
I, I would like to share encouragement, though, because God has been so faithful when we get down on our knees and we just give everything to him. You know, when COVID first started, um, everything got shut down in this place. We, we live in the city and and it went quiet. There was no cars on the roads, nothing. It was just it was eerie. But my job got shut down because all the kids couldn't come to school and the parents panicked and they began to call me and they said, what are we going to do? And uh, that's when I, I didn't know anything about COVID and I got down on my knees and I thought, well, what if it is really dangerous? You know, what if we all will die or whatever? And I know better than that, but um, there was a fear in there and I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, what do I do? about the children in the school and um i opened my bible while on my knees and it opened to the verse that says suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not now we were not allowed to hold any classes or have any groups in our homes or in churches or in schools or anything but the parents brought their kids to me and i continued to teach them throughout the summer in my home um then the churches were also shut down and people were coming on sabbath to knock on the doors because they were anxious and scared and say you know these are people who were not necessarily christian or believers and say you know we need we need something we need god and um they were being told you can't come in that's mandated and uh so my husband and i gave our address to the people at the church and we said give the people our home address and we started home church you know nobody nobody reported us that was in the early stages and um we stood for conviction and and god provided but at the end of the summer, God convicted my husband and I, you need to get out of the city um, and you need to sell your home. And so we had a, a, a like a, a fixer upper house. <laughs> and so it was going to take a lot of doing. And we started in, in May and it took us all summer to do it. And we sold our home. This is how God provided. We sold our home. And two days before the closing date, which is on the 28th of this month, uh, no, two days after, my husband gets his last paycheck as he has lost his job. So we have no more mortgage and we have no more home, um, no more jobs, but we have God and we've been looking all over. Where are we going to live? Lord, help us. We're in a predicament because winter is here. There's a lot of places where it's already snowing. And uh, what are we going to do? And the Lord answered that too. Um, a, um, one of our friends sent us a link. Now, the people who put the, the advertisement on the Internet said it should not have been shown by, or seen by everybody, but it was seen by us which was a miracle and uh it was for house sitting and so we're going to be going out onto a 600 acre farm way out in the country rent free and with um little cabins on the side as an airbnb and whatever we rent out we get to keep the income and the lord blessed us in that the only problem is our closing date like i said is the 28th we don't see the money for our house until the 29th, but we have to be out. And I was picturing that we would be on the sidewalk with our furniture stacked around us, waiting until we could get enough money to rent a truck. And uh, I presented my case to the lawyer and he was basically said, like, there's nothing I can do. So I presented my case to the Lord and the Lord is so faithful. I went to see a Bible study contact that day um, and she didn't know our predicament 
But before I left, she said, I have something for you. It's a, a, a card. And so she gave it to me. She said, I want you to read it right now. So I opened it up and out fell $5,000. This gave us enough to move, to get a U-Haul truck and to get our, our furniture and, and to be able to move to our um, new place. Now, we only have the new place until, you know, the end of of winter till May and then we don't know because the properties are very very expensive but I have to tell you this experience because God has been so faithful we lose our jobs we lose our, our house you know we didn't lose our house we sold our house um, but that was God providing as well and we're out of the city and God says get down on your knees present your case and I will hear you and answer you, and you will glorify me. Right. Um, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to share a quote that um, inspired me through all of this time of, of wandering and searching and being anxious and praying. And it says this, our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept um, the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain pass before their feet. And so I held on to this promise because God says he will faithful and he will provide. Julie, that is so touching and is so encouraging. And I hope all of our viewers are listening right now. God will provide. God will find a way. We may not see it clearly right now, but God will find a way. Yes, he will. And I can honestly say each of us, including myself, wonder the similar questions you have mentioned. God will find a way for us. And even, yeah. even in our story with Dr. Carly, God will find a way. He always, he will never forsake us. He will never leave us. Thank you, Julie, for bringing that out. And I want to turn to Pastor Kelly. Pastor Kelly, with so many different stories of so many different people who are hurting and yet find the joy in believing and trusting in Jesus. I know you have some encouraging words for all of us tonight. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Leela. You know, uh, my heart is breaking and it is hopeful at the same time. And as I have listened tonight, almost uh, just brought to tears at the uh, beautiful deep love, the growing trust of those that have testified tonight. I think we find ourselves as the nation of Israel did in the days of Jeremiah. And God had some very stern rebukes for the church. And I'm, I'm hearing the words of Pastor Rafferty a little earlier in this program challenging the church. Um, the words of Jeremiah, of Jeremiah chapter 23, it says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. But God gave courage. He says in verse 4, I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them and they will not be afraid any longer nor be terrified nor will any be missing declares the Lord now, my appeal tonight is to challenge uh, those that are leaders in this Seventh-day Adventist church uh, this same book in chapter 17 verse 9 says that the heart is more deceitful than all else and it's desperately wicked and who can understand it? And just above that verse in verse eight, it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield, yield fruit. The beautiful confidence of each of these people that have testified the peace that's flooded their heart and filled their soul, of the provision of God. 
You know, to cross that spiritual Jordan and see Jesus face to face, we're going to need these chapters. And God's giving them to us. But there is an appeal in all of these testimonies that those who have strength and influence and those that have not lost yet and still have finance and education and opportunity, they have to rise up. They have to stand in the breach. In John chapter 10, there's this combination of challenge and hope. And it's Jesus, the good shepherd. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, John 10, verse nine, he will be saved and I will go in and out. He will go in and out and find pasture. Then he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I'm come that they might have life and they have it more abundantly. And you cannot help but hear tonight in the stories of these people, this sweet deepness in the midst of this heartache that Jesus is becoming more real to them, more precious. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is who you have tonight for all of these dear, precious brothers and sisters in the Lord that have testified. You have the shepherding of Jesus Christ. You have his presence in your heart. You have his guiding hand in your life. You have the promise of his provision for everything you're going through and everything you will face. And your testimony is encouragement to the rest of us that when those times come for us, He's real. And this unseen God is showing up in ways that is absolutely undeniable in your lives and your testimonies are bearing it to be true and you're overcoming and we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the work of your testimony. But one slight challenge before we're all done comes from John 10 verse 12. It says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming. And he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. I'm appealing to my fellow pastors. I'm appealing to my pastor administrators. If ever the sheep needed the shepherd to carry the rod and stand in the kindness and the firmness and the strength of God, it's now. How could you listen to these things and not have your heart rent with the pain of the sheep? So I'm, I'm praying for every elder, every pastor, every administrator. I'm appealing to every single one. Isn't it time to stand up? Isn't it time to say enough is enough? Does the, the closing of a society have to come to our country, our home, our county before we do anything? Have we never read the verse that says the fear of man brings a snare? It's time. And I just want to say you that have testified so faithfully tonight, you have Jesus, even if nobody else stands by your side. And he will be all you will ever need. But in the meantime, until every earthly human support is removed, as the spirit of prophecy reminds us, there is a, there is a mantle, there is a call, there is a demand for faithful shepherds to stand up and defend the flock of God and to keep the opportunity of free speech and proclamation of this gospel message available while time shall last. We may get a respite. There may be some easing of this trauma. If there is, oh, God's church must be very faithful and very focused on getting the word out that there is a good shepherd and he will guide you all the way to the new kingdom and stand by your side. God will help us, Dr. Leela, and God will help us, all those that have faithfully testified tonight. He is, he will, he is faithful. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. I know we had a little bit of technical issues, but that was powerful. Again, appealing appealing to those of us who are having some difficulties and similar to the stories that we've heard and appealing to our church leadership to stand, to stand. Now is the time to be Daniel. Now is the time to be Esther. Who knows? Who knows? Perhaps we were called for such a time as this. You know, I too have been very touched by tonight's presentation. God will make a way. When there seems to be no way, he works in ways we cannot see. He, my God, will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, God will make a way. 
If you haven't yet heard that song, I want to ask you to listen to Laura Williams. As she sings this song to us, she actually produced this song just for the program today. Listen to the words of this beautiful, beautiful song. Perhaps you're having trouble pulling this up. Pastor Kelly, can you give us our final appeal for this evening and closing prayer? We do not have a high priest who do not sympathize with our weakness, but one who's been tempted in all things, yet as we are without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is faithful. He's listening. He made a way through the wilderness. And all of us will have our own story of his faithfulness in our lives. 
Let us draw near to the one that ever lives to make intercession for us and have confidence that his eyes on the sparrow and his eyes on each of us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the beautiful encouragement in song, in the teaching of the word, and in the faithfulness of your people. Thank you for the testimonies that have been shared here tonight. And I ask now, Lord, that each of us would be given a new resolve, to stand for what is right with wisdom and grace, without fear, and in full assurance that you take care of your own. We seek you now and thank you in the beautiful name of Jesus who shed his blood for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you to each of you for joining us this evening. We hope and pray that you've been blessed, and I know I've been blessed. Until next time, may God keep you happy and healthy and him. And please remember, God will make a way. God's blessing.